Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I trust you have enjoyed this morning's discussions about how to nurture students to be socially responsible citizens. Universities clearly play an important role in that mission. We are delighted this afternoon to have five distinguished speakers sharing with us on the subject of university strategies and models as they pertain to social responsibility. Let me briefly introduce them. Professor James Thompson, far left, over there, Associate Vice President for Social Responsibility from the University of Manchester. Next to him is Professor Yan, Yan Shijing, Vice President of Sichuan University. Uh, in the middle there is Professor Masao Kitano, Executive Vice President for Education, Information Infrastructure and Evaluation from Kyoto University. And next to him is Associate Pro Professor Peter Pang, Assistant Vice President, University and Global Relations from National University of Singapore. And next to me is Mr. Joseph Sun, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, School of Engineering and Applied Science from the University of Pennsylvania. At the end of all the presentations, there will be time for Q&A. I encourage you to submit your questions to our conference staff by using the forms provided. I think they're on the tables or in your packets. So without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Professor James Thompson. Professor Thompson will explain how the University of Manchester is making a difference in society, culture, the economy, and the environment through its research, programs, and outreach. Professor Thompson. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to Hong Kong Polytechnic University, uh, Professor Timothy Tong and Professor Angie Yuen for inviting me uh, to this uh, fantastic conference. Um, as you might have seen from my uh, biography in the PACS, um, I am an Associate Vice President for Social Responsibility, but um, I also have a day job, which is that I'm a Professor of Theatre Studies. Um, and I was really delighted, therefore, that Professor uh, Tong uh, started this morning's presentation by quoting George Bernard Shaw. Um, now, there's another quote from George Bernard Shaw, um, and I thought this was pretty appropriate since this, I am the after-lunch speaker. Um, Professor uh, um, George Bernard Shaw, I'm uh, not Professor, but George Bernard Shaw uh, is also known for a quote where he says, there is no sincerer love than the love of food. Um, <laughs> And now, I don't think George Bernard Shaw ever came to Hong Kong, but I know that he would have loved it if he did come here, with that quote in mind. Um, so I am uh, uh, Associate Vice President for Social Responsibility, and what I want to do uh, this afternoon is explain a little bit about my university, a little bit about the work we do, um, and also try and explain how we've organized the social responsibility work uh, that we do uh, at Manchester. Um, uh, for people who don't know the University of Manchester, it has its origins uh, in a, uh, from as far back as uh, 1824. It's a classic civic institution in the heart of Manchester, which to us, of course, is the, the city of the Industrial Revolution. We see it as the original modern city. Um, it is currently the largest university in the whole of the United Kingdom. There was a piece of research recently conducted by a professor of education uh, from London, and she was talking about uh, the, the, the pressures on contemporary modern universities. And her um, article is called The Hollowed Out University. And her thesis is that the pressures on universities currently have hollowed out the values that are at the heart of them. So they've now been pushed to new forms of commercialization, and they've lost some of the values on which they were founded. In a sense, her thesis says, universities have become very good at articulating what they're good at. So a university will say, we're good at this, we're good at cancer studies, we're good at that, we're the best at this, we're the best at that. But universities have started to forget not what they're good at, they've started to forget what they're good for. 
and for the purpose of the University of Manchester, social responsibility is there to remind us not so much what we're good at, but to remind us what we are good for. So at the university, we're really simple in the way we think about our mission uh, and our agendas. We simply have three goals as a university. Two are really obvious goals. That's the goal of excellent research and excellent teaching and learning. But our third goal is social responsibility. So we are, in a sense, trying to argue against the professor who said we live in a time of hollowed out universities to reanimate the idea that universities at the heart should have a sense of civic value and a sense of purpose about why they are there. So what I want to do for the rest of my talk is talk about how we organize the area of social responsibility at Manchester. And it's what we call, as you'll see on the slide here, making a difference. How we as an institution make a difference to the people in our communities and people uh, across the nation and internationally. Uh, this is my uh, rather simple graphic to try and explain uh, what we do. Um, we've divided uh, our social responsibility agenda into five areas so that it covers across all the activities that we do. First of all, you'll see the bit in red, which is, says research with impact, the idea that our research is there to make a positive social difference to the world. The bit in green says socially responsible graduates. That's the future of, of, of our university and the future of our society is dependent on the quality of our, the graduates that we produce. The brown bit at the bottom, engaging our communities. The way we as an institution interact with the communities around us. And we have one term which is hyper-local. We think about the communities that rub up against the university, our immediate neighbours, but as well as the wider city, the wider region, and of course internationally. The bit uh, on to the side of this says responsible processes. A vital part of social responsibility for us is how we treat our own staff how we employ people, how we look after people, how we promote people. And the final bit is uh, up in light blue is the notion of environmental sustainability. That's absolutely crucial for us that we think about the role we have in the wider the world and uh, protecting the world for future generations. Now this is the way we organize our social responsibility agenda, but we sort of have some highlight projects under each of these headings. And these highlight projects is what I'll go on to explain now. Um, each one, in a sense, is an exemplar of some of the word we, work we do under each one of these particular areas. And you'll see them there. The, the one is addressing inequalities, ethical grand challenges, uh, school governors initiative, cultural access program, something called the works, and the final one is called staff steps to sustainability. I just want to explain each one of these uh, in turn. So under research with impact, um, we have a huge amount of research at the university that has positive social benefit, whether it's the work of my colleague Bertrand Tate, Professor Bertrand Tate here, who's the director of an institute called the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute that both teaches and researches humanitarian response and emergency response to disasters. But we have a particular focus uh, in research with impact at the moment, which is called our Addressing Inequalities Signature Programme. What we're trying to do in the next period, the next three years, is orientate a huge raft of our research at the university to address issues of social inequality in our particular Greater Manchester region. We have some of the worst indicators, for example, of health inequalities in the whole of the British Isles. And what we want to do is orientate our research to really tackle some of the issues of inequalities in our region. Uh, but also, we're, we're galvanizing our education researchers, our, our social scientists, people who work on issues of employment, to work together across disciplines so they start to tackle issues in our immediate community. And this is a signature program that we'll be running certainly for the next three years. And in the short term, it's particularly focused on some of the issues that we're faced with in our own community. The next um, signature program I just want to talk about is our Ethical Grand Challenges signature program. What we realize, we graduate approximately 8,000 students every year. So we have 8,000 people going out into the workplace, out into the world to try and make a difference to the world that they engage with. And we realize this is one of our biggest resources. 
So what we, our ambition is, rather than giving people an option uh, to undertake certain types of courses, we want our students to be faced with some of the common great dilemmas that face everybody today. So across a three-year undergraduate program at Manchester, every student will have a component on issues of environmental sustainability in their first year, every student will do something about social justice in their second year, and every student will do some um, coursework on workplace ethics in their third year. This is whether you're training to be a dentist, a medic, whether you're an English literature student, a history student, uh, whatever your subject area, you will be in, uh, you'll be faced with some of these dilemmas across your three-year program. We're, gonna, we're, we're doing the pilots for this work at the moment, trying to work out a common program to implement with 8,000 students in one go is a fairly tall task, but we think it's very important to do it. Um, engaging our communities. There is lots of different ways that students and staff at Manchester work with their local communities through volunteering, through service learning, uh, through project courses. But we've got a, a couple of signature programs that are really tightly focused to make the most difference we can uh, to particular areas of, of, of social need. Uh, Greater Manchester has some schools which are very, very poorly served in terms of governance and are in areas of very high deprivation. Uh, all schools in the UK require a, a governing board that's made up of volunteers, usually drawn from parents or from the local community. But schools in areas of high disadvantage really struggle to get high quality volunteers to be on their governing uh, boards. So as a university, we've worked with, an international, um, with a national organisation to identify new volunteers to get our staff to volunteer for those schools with the, the most um, disadvantage in the local area. And over the last year, we've uh, created a huge cohort of staff members who now volunteer in local schools. Um, the important thing about this program is it's designed for all staff across the institution. So you could be working in finance, you could be working in human resources, you could be a professor of classics, you could, uh, your, your work can be in any area of the university, uh, but we believe you've got something to offer the local schools. Um, this program uh, very recently won a national award. Um, what's interesting about it is, uh, if you look at this table uh, here, is the University of Manchester has created more volunteer school governors than all these other organisations. The largest employer in the whole of the UK is the National Health Service, and we've provided more school governors than the National Health Service, and that list of both private and public sector organisations. Just by focusing really clearly on this area, we've made a huge difference to some of the more disadvantaged schools in our local area. Another way that we as an institution engage with our communities is through what we call our cultural institutions. As, an, as a university, we own four, um, four institutions. We have something called the Whitworth Art Gallery, we have Manchester Museum, we have a major observatory called Jodrell Bank, and we have a major old uh, library called the John Rylands University Library. All those institutions have come together to have a targeted program for schools that um, are the closest, most disadvantaged schools to the, to the university. And we've, given a, we've created this cultural guarantee that every nine-year-old in schools closest to the university with the highest levels of deprivation, every nine-year-old will have a cultural experience at one of our cultural institutions every year going forward in the next few years. Um, this is a program that we've funded, we've worked with the cultural institutions, and it's free for every single nine-year-old. So they get the transport, they get the whole cultural package, and there's a whole series of packages to encourage them to return with their parents and return at another time. Responsible processes is how we as an institution treat the people that live and work in the institution. We did some um, research with local communities about what they thought our process should be. And obviously, what you discover is they're not very interested in how many senior lecturers get promoted to professor. They're not interested in some of the technical internal processes of the university. What they most said, the people within the Greater Manchester community, is we want to work there. How do you get a job in the university? And right next to the university, we have, we have areas of very high unemployment. But there seemed to be a, a great barrier between those areas and the university, which was not porous. It was like a, a wall between uh, the, the university and the wider community. 
Over a period of time, what we decided to do is create um, unemployment clubs within two of the most immediate areas and provide resource to train people to get ready for work. So we do work on training how to write CVs, interview practice, and a whole range of other techniques. Those centers, they're called The Works, um, and we have two of these centers. They're now partnering with a whole range of local employers. And we've helped get um, now, with the target originally, as it says here, was 750 um, unemployed people back to work. We're now hitting more, more than 1,000 people. We've got new jobs in different employers across the region. And many hundreds of those have come into jobs at the university. So now what we're getting is a much better relationship between this, that, those communities and the university, because so many members of staff immediately in the university are, are come directly from the most uh, local communities to us. And the final uh, signature program I just want to talk about is uh, around environmental sustainability. We have a huge amount of work to be done uh, as a university in terms of the carbon footprint of the university, in terms of our estate, in terms of the long-term maintenance of our state, and in terms of new buildings that we build. But one of the crucial parts of that picture is the attitude and behavior of our staff and the people who live and work in the university. And one thing we've decided to do is make a guarantee that every member of staff who, are, who now works at the university will, will have an opportunity to take a, a, a program of, of information and training around environmental sustainability. It's, we feel it's absolutely vital that our people who work with us understand issues of natural resource literacy, um, issues around carbon, uh, and a whole range of environmental sustainability issues, so that gradually as an institution we take on board some of the pressing issues uh, in that area. Just to conclude, um, in the next few years, what we tried to do is change, we used to have a, um, a social responsibility agenda that was everything to everybody. We had uh, thousands of projects, lots of different work, and in the last year or so, we've decided that it's much better to have a, a sort of focused execution of these programs to have the greatest impact possibly uh, on areas of disadvantage, our local communities or international communities. So we're now really focused to really make uh, a huge difference to those particular communities. And one part of that, besides this sort of focus and the concentration on measuring our impact, is also communicating what we're doing so that people in the wider community, people in the wider world, understand exactly not only, as I said at the beginning, what we're good at, but continue and start to understand what we as a university are good for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Thompson, for giving us such a clear picture of how the University of Manchester is making impact through its signature programs. Um, our second speaker is Professor Yan Shijing, who will talk about how Sichuan University's active involvement in disaster relief and post-disaster reconstruction demonstrates its commitment to social responsibility. Please welcome Professor Yan. Honorable Chairman, dear colleagues, good afternoon. Here I'm going to share with you with regard to the responsibility, social responsibility and crisis uh, handling. So first I want to say, you know, uh, service learning is the trend going forward for Sichuan University when we uh, the role that we have played in disaster relief. Third, I would like to talk about uh, the lessons we learned from this uh, experience. Uh, from the history of higher education, we have seen that in order to promote the social progress, this is always the main mission of university. With the development of economy, university has become the main propeller of economy. It is one of the main forces of driving economy. Various kinds of disasters are the are among one of the biggest challenges among the world for universities. We have the responsibility and obligation to shoulder disaster relief and play an important role in post-disaster relief. 
the first. We're looking at how we service our community. That is the major trend of the development of university. We, our university, we have experienced a lot of era in our development of society, from the agricultural society to the industrial society and to the modern society. So we have accumulated a lot of experience and valuable insight as to how to confront and overcome uh, dangers and issues in times of crisis. So therefore, that we can surface regional uh, issues, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. We need to create impact for our society and to help with the development of our society. We need to think about the first class of university. That is that we need to nurture the first class of talent and provide them opportunity to enter into the society, to create interaction with the society, with the people in the society. We need to nurture, nurture talent and to create a sense of mission in them. And then so that they will be able to render service to the community, to show the responsibility, to lead our society, to head towards, to forge a ground for the future. And then so these are the mission of our scholars today. Only if they can contribute for the society, then they will be able to recognize and respect by the society. And so that to re have more opportunities and time and space to help to create more impact and therefore to contribute their functions and their talent to the world. In the recent decades, people, human societies are confronted with natural a disaster and then also that create a lot of French population with a diversity with a dichotomy of a wealth wealthy people and the poverty it has brought to, to us so much challenge as, as a university we are the we are this environment that can create people that can gather talent. We, have, we are the most capable of institute to lead our society, to provide our leaders for our community so that they could resolve problems, particularly when a society uh, attacked by natural disaster. So in that aspect, I would like to share with you our experience in Sichuan in the time of disaster, how we overcome all the, 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 the issues. In 1896, we established Sichuan uh, University. We, are, we have 118 years of a history. So, and Sichuan University, we are the university of a century. We are capable to capture the talent and to gather the strength of our society to create this pool for the people to join together and then to help to resolve a lot of our social problems, particularly in the Wenchuan earthquake in, in uh, several years ago. We, in, in time of that crisis, we help, we respond quickly, we help the people in the disastrous area and using the speediest time to make use of the most professional of a rescue team together with medical professionals, psychological professionals to be there in the at the promptest time. And also that with all these are the people that who volunteer their time and their effort in in helping with um, with the victim. We have provided the following uh, work in, in the area where it was attacked by the earthquake. 
we help to rebuild the community. We help to build, rebuild the schools. At the, at the first time, at the beginning, we encourage our students, our university students, to enter into this project as a volunteer work and to go to Wenchuan to help with the victim to rebuild the society and we build the school. And all of that work, we will give them credit in their, in their, in their curriculum. So, and because that is the time that in light in the same time of the school exam, that is in May to Ju July. And so that we would allow a very flexible credit um, system so that allowed the student to volunteer the time to go to the earthquake area to help. And also because the, the, the earthquake area encompasses quite a large area. So we think it is a good training base for our talent to engage in scientific reconstruction of the earthquake hit area, to understand the seismic uh, structure and to rethink about the future precautionary measures. We also vigorously provide suggestions for reconstructions of the earthquake-stricken area. We need to survey the area. We survey the area. We think about how to rebuild that area. What kind of element of a society would, need it, would be needed in that area? So we put that into a one big blueprint. And also we built this connection platform, a communication platform for the local professionals and the overseas professionals. We invited some of these uh, professional seismic experts to come to Shituan to collect data, to study the seismic uh, consequence or that whether there is going to have the after uh, the quake. Whether we would need to have more of the measures to train the people how to react in time of that disaster. We also create a feel for our medical students because in Shituan, under this earthquake impact, we will need to have a large pool of uh, medical professionals to help. And so that the student, medical school student will be able to conduct this uh, clinical um, work and also to do research to gather a lot of the data for their future research. Maybe you didn't know. And uh, we have 90 million of a po po population. And then we have 10% of the disabled people being affected by the earthquake. And so we, how we in the SEU to work together to respond to the, this kind of um, uh, problem. So I will share with you later on about the work we did in that area. But the thing is that we, we, we create this platform in the earthquake area. And then we create multiple of a channel for different talents to gather information, to communicate, and to study this natural disaster for its impact and for the precautionary measure. I think that natural disaster is, um, it is by nature something we is inevitable. We do need to understand it when human, in under the under the attack of this natural result, uh, natural disaster, what we should do and how we can pull ourselves together to join handedly to contribute for the social responsibility. I think that we need to, I think that when in time of crisis, the rebuilding of a society is, the, of, is of the utmost importance. We need to consider how we help the society to rebuild itself not only the fabric of the society, but also the how to help it to rebuild its economy and, and, and social ecological system. 
we use that as an opportunity to put that reconstruction into one of our curriculum and as a very as a very important curriculum as well. We also need to start to establish new uh, project to encourage our people to be able to respond promptly and appropriately in in time of crisis. That is to say that not only that we learned in theory what kind of disaster there is and how we should do that, we need to practice it and then also that to learn about the consequence and then how to uh, help with the survivors. When we also need to think about that scientifically, not only that we need to reconstruct our society, but scientifically, we we need to think that in an in innovative way, scientific way, that to understand the disaster, so that we could be able to have a real-time understanding about the impact of the disaster and also to have more understanding about the cost of it and uh, the relevant impact of it. We would also need to use, make use of all these statistics and information that we gather. And then we need to be able to to, 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 to communicate such findings with the regional and municipal government, to let them make use of it and let them understand that when they are um, when they are creating policies around the area, they need to take that into consideration. And I also share another uh, examples with you. We have we have a lot of uh, philanthropy actions in Hong Kong and the neighboring countries for to help the victims of the uh, Wenchuan earthquake. So we, we, we particularly need to mention them here is that as the university, particularly like a public university such as the Sichuan University, under the crisis of a 2008 earthquake, we were confronted with this grave impact. And then just one week after the earthquake, universities from Hong Kong came to Sichuan and they help us fully in all aspects and the whole entire time to try their best to engage in the, in, in the work that helped to construct and reconstruct and then also to help with the survivors and the victims of the Wintran earthquake. So I think that we, we 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 greatly appreciate that. So we think that in, but we think that to help with this uh, impact of the earthquake is not a short term work. It need to be a long term work. We are. We are one of the one of the very few universities that we survive this earthquake, and we live in the middle of such a major crisis. We have the experience, so we think that we should create this interactive platform, allow other universities, not only universities from Hong Kong, to come to China to work with us, to use that as a platform of learning. And then so creating a lot of uh, understudies, a curriculum, and a, ma master stu um, a master studies uh, curriculum to help that. And then so next year, we are going to work together with the University of Manchester to create this a two and two undergraduate program. And then to uh, this program is to, under to study the a safety measure in crisis. So we hope this is one impact that we can create after this uh, crisis. We use that as a this case study, and we we are very grateful for all the work that um, universities all over um, putting forward in helping us, and also that we have greatly appreciate that we have this opportunity to create such curriculum and to join him with all of you to uh, to nurture talent. And I think that if you are interested and willing to engage in the crisis management um, curriculum, to work together with academics, scientists, and students, please do join with us. And then so we can jointly create a better international platform to 
uh, to nurture future scientists and scholars in uh, to overcome and then to ta to tackle the crisis that the nature giving to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yan. Uh, universities do have a very important role to play in immediate disaster relief and also in long-term training of personnel equipped to respond to disaster. May I remind everyone if you have questions for our uh, speakers to write them down uh, on the paper uh, and then pass it to the staff. Professor Masao Kitano is our next speaker. He will share with us on how Kyoto University has incorporated new models of learning to enrich, enrich student experience and exposure in relation to developing social responsibility. Let's welcome Professor Kitano. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and to share some of the latest development in Kyoto University activities related to service learning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, President Timothy Tong, Angelina Yuen, and other members of PolyU for providing me uh, this wonderful opportunity. Uh, Kyoto University was founded in 1897 as the second imperial university to be established in Japan. Uh, located in Kyoto, a uh, center of traditional Japanese culture, our three campuses accommodate some 23,000 students. At present, Kyoto University is comprised of 10 faculties, 18 graduate schools, 14 research institute and other establishment. The university's central mission is to sustain and develop its historical commitment to academic freedom and to pursue harmonious coexistence within the human and the ecological community on this planet. Since its founding, uh, Kyoto University has been dedicated to furthering higher education guided by its core values of academic freedom, open dialogue, and self-reliance and self-respect. Graduates of the university play important roles in both national and in international affairs as key players in politics, industry, and society. To ensure that our students gain experience in working with the community, uh, Kyoto University engages in a wide range of service learning projects. Uh, before that, let me introduce our new president, uh, Professor Juichi Yamagiwa. Uh, his research field is primatology. He has been working with gorillas in Congo, Africa. Uh, he is now working with university's management staff, including me. <laughs> anyway, our field work is one of the major activities of Kyoto University. Uh, Kyoto is Japan's old capital, which was designed after Xi'an of Tan Dynasty. Kyoto is now a center of traditional Japanese culture. It is also a hub for high-tech innovation and development. Uh, Kyoto University is an important player of the community. There are two central pillars supporting our service learning activities, uh, education and research. I'll begin by highlighting our service learning project in education which include field-based learning as well as tr training as part of the curriculum at Kyoto University's newly established graduate schools. Later, I'll talk about how Kyoto University activity promotes community engagement in research. Uh, supported by the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, MEXT, uh, one of Kyoto University's government subsidized center of community project is uh, Kokoroiki project. Uh, Kokoroiki means uh, spirit, but if we use a different kanji character, Kokoroiki means a uh, hearty community. 
this uh, project offers a great number of learning opportunities for students, researchers, and local community, and is one of the one of Kyoto University's biggest projects related to service learning in education. The Center of Community Initiative aims to contribute to the development of global human resources with a broad vision and a high level of expertise. To outline the objective of the Kokoroiki Initiative, the project aims to promote revitalization of local communities and to work with local partners keeping long-term interest of the city in mind. The concept of service, service, uh, serving the community through active engagement and effective cooperation is a top priority. In addition, the project draws on the advantage, advantage of the local characteristic of Kyoto, a city with a rich historical heritage, at the same time as promoting global thinking and cultural in the understanding. Uh, we have developed uh, programs within the Kokoloiki project that specifically aim to serve the community. For example, local groups and individuals can learn and participate in lectures about Kyoto, focusing on future strategies for the city as a whole. Another way in which we actively collaborate with the local community is through field-based studies. Here, participants are learning about kyoyasai, uh, that's a traditional Kyoto vegetables, which have developed over the centuries in Kyoto and have sparked a resurgence of interest in recent years. At Kyoto University's design school, our students are given unique opportunities uh, to work on real-world projects. Design school offers a multidisciplinary program spanning the fields of informatics, mechanical engineering, architecture, management, and psychology. At the design school, uh, the emphasis is on field-based learning and problem-based learning. One of our key objectives is to cultivate the next generation of innovative leaders. Upon completion of five-year integrated doctoral program, students are expected to have developed diverse skills to contribute to solving real-world problems. As an example of the ways in which design school collaborate with the community, I would like to highlight the Book World project led by Professor Teruyuki Monai at, of Kyoto University's Department of Architecture and Architectural Engineering. Designed in accommodation with Kyoto City's uh, Rakuyu Elementary School, the Book World project involved joint effort by student, designers, and teachers to develop a brand new type of library for collective and acti acting learning. I would like to highlight uh, Kyoto University's Shishukan uh, Graduate School, which was selected in 2011 as part of MEXT program for leading graduate schools. Significantly, this newly launched uh, graduate school program includes service learning as a built-in part of the curriculum. As Shishukan graduate school, at Shishukan graduate school, we are breaking the mold in many ways. Uh, student Students benefit from a multi-tutor system with unique opportunities to learn about fields ranging from medical science and pharmacology to law and economics. As shown in this summary, students in the fourth year conduct international field work 
and five-year program culminate in hands-on project-based research. Service learning is an essential part of the curricula at Shukan. For first-year students, there is a Japan-focused service learning program. And for second-year students, there are an international service learning program. Students undertake internships at site, including nursing homes in Japan, as well as internships overseas through collaboration with organizations, including the Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA. Now I would like to turn to the service learning in the realm of research. Every year at Kyoto University, we hold an event that promotes open dialogue between researchers and members of the public. This event called Academic Day directly addresses the government, governmental policy of encouraging public engagement in science and technology. This Academic Day poster shows a logo depicting the concept of dialogue. It was specially designed for this occasion by the renowned graphic designer Akio Okumura, who has produced some of the Japan's most recognizable logos. The three main objectives of Academic Day are to disseminate the result of research to society, to enable researchers to talk about their work in their own words, and to build further bridges between science and society. People attending Academic Day can expect to enjoy a wide range of events that encourage conversation in noble ways. In 2014, Academic Day attracted nearly 500 people. They had the opportunity to take part in lively discussions, even sitting around Japanese-style tea tables to talk with researchers in a unique and informal way. In conclusion, uh, we at Kyoto University values a higher standard of excellence in education and research. Service learning is an integral part of a wide-ranging activities to foster global com competitiveness and respond to real-world needs. We look forward to continuing to learn from and work with our partners in Japan and, and beyond to realize these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kitano. Indeed, um, field-based, real-world uh, service learning will become increasingly significant in 21st century university curricula. Now please welcome our next speaker, Professor Peter Pang, who is going to speak about NUS social responsibility strategies at the Policy and Management, Education and Research student-led initiative levels. Professor Peng. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. And uh, um, I really want to thank uh, the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, uh, President Tong and uh, Vice President Yuan for organizing this uh, very, very meaningful uh, event. Um, I'm hoping to learn a lot from this, uh, from this uh, gathering. Um, as you can see, I um, have uh, now um, been given a second hat to wear, um, and that's uh, as uh, Associate Provost uh, Student Life. And um, as Associate uh, Provost Student Life, uh, I'm very much hoping to um, uh, build upon the service learning programs at the university, um, as well as um, um, to uh, promote interaction between local and international students on our campus. So these are things that um, I'm very much hoping to you know, learn from the, uh, the experts uh, in, the, in the audience. Um, so a quick uh, introduction of the National University of Singapore. We were founded in 1905. So next year we'll be celebrating our 110th anniversary. 
Um, we started as a very, very small medical school, but now we are a sort of a fairly uh, good-sized university, 37,000 students. Um, we are a comprehensive university. We have two medical schools, law school and uh, arts, science, engineering, business, uh, school of public policy, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're divided into 16 faculties and schools ac across three campuses uh, in Singapore. Um, no campus outside of Singapore. Um, we uh, are a research-intensive university, so we have 26 university-level research institutes, uh, not including the faculty and departmental-level research institutes. Um, among the 26 uh, university-level research institutes, we have one which is located in Suzhou, and that is essentially our only um, sort of permanent uh, uh, physical facility outside of uh, Singapore. Now, besides the 26 uh, university level research institutes, we also have a large number of national labs or national research institutes um, on our campus, including uh, what we call the research centers of excellence of the Singapore government. Um, so, um, just a quick uh, recap of our vision and mission. Um, Essentially, what I wanted to say is that uh, as the National University of Singapore, we are uh, uh, very much cognizant of our role in um, uh, our, our national role, right? In furthering the uh, economic activities, economic development, as well as in terms of contributing to society uh, in Singapore and, and beyond. Um, so this quote I've taken from our uh, latest uh, 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 annual uh, report, uh, and it says that NUS remains steadfast and firm in our, in our commitment to serving society in Singapore and beyond. And what I hope to do um, is to give you a bit of a snapshot um, on the three levels uh, in which we um, um, think that we are making contributions uh, to to uh, the society in Singapore and beyond. Um, I will not aim to be comprehensive, so I'll give you just some examples of what we do in the in the three different levels. So they are policy and management, education and research, and student-led initiatives. Um, first, uh, policy and and management. Um, so um, we have uh, formed uh, in two thousand and nine, if I'm not mistaken, um, a university-wide Office of Environmental Sustainability. Um, the role of the Office of Environmental Sustainability is to integrate sustainability into our operations, planning, construction, education, research, instruction, and public service. Now, the Office um, reports uh, to um, our Deputy President for Administration and is responsible really for setting policies for the whole university, right, in all these areas that I've mentioned. Um, in, particular is, in particular, it says the, the green standards uh, for the university uh, in the following areas, in energy, usage of energy, in water, waste, transportation, and natural spaces. Um, many of you would know that, uh, you know, Singapore is a very hot place, and uh, our carbon footprint is actually quite bad in Singapore uh, because we need air conditioning everywhere in Singapore because of the weather. And uh, we sometimes joke that in Singapore, uh, we have two seasons, indoors and outdoors. <laughs> uh, well, you, you uh, lit literally need a sort of a light jacket and all that in, uh, uh, indoors. Um, so, um, at, at, well, nationally as well as, the, as at the university, I think we are putting in quite a bit of thought into how we can improve our carbon footprint. Um, so the university president has set uh, a target of reducing our carbon footprint by 23% uh, below business as usual by 2020. Um, so there is very rigorous sort of uh, energy audit and so on and so forth. Um, now when we um, sort of uh, design a new building on campus and all that, we always um, do a great deal of airflow analysis. And some of, some of you may also notice that if you go to Singapore, you know there are many, many shopping malls in Singapore, right? Um, so some of the newer shopping malls are beginning to just air condition the shops, but not the public areas, right? Not the corridors and all that. Um, and instead, you know, they do sort of airflow analysis so that there is sort of natural 
uh, airflow so that you don't need to use so much air conditioning. Um, we've done that particularly rigorously at uh, NUS, I think, and therefore in the last few years, uh, we've won a number of uh, green awards uh, in some of the new buildings that we've uh, put up at the, uh, at the university. So um, that's the NUS Office of Environmental Sustainability. Um, they do a lot of education programs, awareness uh, uh, campaigns. Um, they also organize a lot of student activities, you know, student competitions, and so on and so forth. Um, the other one I want to mention, uh, by the way, my examples uh, today um, um, focus a lot on energy, right? And that's just because I want to be a bit focused rather than sort of go all over the place. And in a way, um, energy is also one of our biggest challenges in Singapore in terms of, um, you know, where we think we can contribute uh, to the Singapore society. So the other uh, example I wanted to give is a platform that we use um, to do benchmarking, to learn from others, to share experiences and so on. And that's the International Sustainable Campus Network, um, ISCN. ISCN was born out of uh, uh, GAUF, uh, Global University Leaders Forum, which itself is part of the Davos uh, Economic Forum uh, that's held every year. So NUS has been involved in Davos for many, many years now. Um, and we were one of the founding members of this uh, International Sustainable Campus Network, which now has, I believe, 67 members. Um, uh, Stanford is a member, UPenn is a member, uh, Hong Kong U is a member, uh, Beta Tsinghua are members. Um, and the network is actually jointly hosted by five universities, uh, ETH in Zurich, EPFL in Lausanne, NUS and NTU uh, in Singapore and University of Hong Kong. So it's jointly hosted by these uh, uh, five institutions. The um, objective of the network really is to exchange ideas and best practices for achieving sustainable campus operations and integrating sustainability in teaching and research. Um, I guess the, uh, the one aspiration of this uh, network is to um, uh, put together sort of practices and policies and so on um, that other universities um, can also adopt and adapt. Um, there's actually one more international platform where we operate, and that's the International Alliance of Research University, which also has sort of a lot of sustainability kinds of uh, programs. So we're actively uh, engaged in all these uh, uh, international networks and platforms uh, besides doing uh, uh, what we do at the university. Um, now I want to come to education and research. I think a lot has been said about education, and we all recognize that uh, 21st century higher education is going to become something completely different from what we've seen in the 20th century. Um, in particular, experiential learning is going to be much, much more important. Classroom learning will become much, much less important in the 21st century. And we believe that service learning is an, ex is an excellent platform for students to do some of the experiential learning where they learn some of the softer skills, teamwork, empathy, and leadership, and so on and so forth. So we are really uh, moving into a sort of service learning uh, now. Um, I think we are still a long way uh, from uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, uh, but uh, we are determined to catch up. Um, <laughs> so that's why I'm here to, to learn. Um, so at NUS, we formed a lot of um, sort of small student learning communities, uh, hoping that you know students, when they get together, they will have ideas, they will have uh, sort of uh, they will take initiative, do their own programs, and so on. Um, so we have this uh, center for community engagement, which was was just set up, which I oversee now. Um, essentially, what we do is uh, we fund student projects, student activities. Right? Students will, you know, propose, will, 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 will submit proposals and we will fund uh, some of them. And our logo is to enable students to help the community. That's the logo, that's the, uh, the, uh, the logo for the Center for uh, Community Engagement. We also have a number of other programs um, that uh, enable students to you know, uh, do projects and initiatives and, and so on. Um, we are beginning to have uh, service learning courses that are for credit. 
and I think that will be ramped up in the next uh, few years uh, quite uh, rapidly. Um, we have the determination and I think the commitment uh, to uh, promote service learning at the university. Um, I don't think uh, we'll be making that compulsory anytime soon, uh, but we certainly hope that a large uh, proportion of our students will engage in such activities. Uh, just a couple of examples, um, a lot of our law students are already, uh, no, by the way, for law students it's compulsory, they must do pro bono work uh, in order to graduate. Um, the medical students, um, they engage in a lot of sort of neighborhood health screening programs uh, that is not compulsory, uh, but a large number of students do that. Um, a large number of medical students also go overseas to do uh, sort of medical related community work. Um, our architecture students as well, I mean, that's just, just some examples, uh, not uh, exhaustive. Um, our architecture students, for example, uh, were involved in a project in uh, the Philippines, uh, working with an NGO there, Gawa Kalinga, uh, building uh, communities, uh, building habitat, and also in, in Cambodia, working with another NGO, STEP, um, on a uh, sort of a slum relocation uh, kind of uh, project. Um, so a little bit about research, uh, we are now organized into six integrative research clusters. And as you can see, um, some has to do with sustainability and aging and biomedical sciences and translational medicine. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, clearly a lot of prospect uh, for a lot of sort of community related work that can spin out of, these, uh, of the research that's done. And that's very much on the mind of the researchers uh, to see how the research can be translated into uh, real community improvement activities. Um, just uh, to give, again, to bring us back to the focus of energy, um, in order to integrate all the energy research that's being done at the university, we have actually formed an energy office at the university. And the role of the office really is to um, uh, work with government, industry, and all that to see how NUS research in, on energy can be used by the community and, uh, and, and at large. Um, the final thing I want to come to is really student-led initiatives, and here there really is a lot. Um, I've put down uh, a few student clubs and organizations that we have on campus. Um, these all have to do with community service, so there's a community service club, there's a road track club, there's the Red Cross uh, Youth, uh, uh, NUS chapter, and so on. Um, some of these have been around for a long time. Energy Carta is a new one. Energy Carta was set up in 2008 purely by the students. The students came together, they wanted to do this, and, um, and they formed a student club called the Energy Carta. Now, what the Energy Carta aims to do is to influence policy in Singapore in the use of energy. So they have uh, a lot of networking with uh, government. They, every year they organize a number of uh, uh, sort of uh, big events, uh, conferences, and so on, completely organized by students. Um, I wanted to mention in particular a student project which is called BHBH that stands for Big Hands, Bigger Hearts. Um, and uh, it's a, a project that is carried out in, uh, in the Philippines in Bago. Um, it's been going on for 10 years, and uh, since the students have been going there for 10 years uh, in, in a sustainable manner, um, they've been uh, really able to create quite a bit of impact uh, in, the, in the local society in Bago. And in particular, a number of our students have uh, uh, started up a, uh, student, uh, a social enterprise uh, at uh, Bago. It's called Bago Sphere. What they, they do training, they do training, uh, particularly I think at the beginning, now they have diversified, but at the beginning, particularly for uh, sort of the call center uh, workers. So these are just some examples of what we do at uh, NUS. And uh, if I come back in a couple of years time, uh, I'm sure I will have more to report. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kang. It's very inspiring to see how NUS is committed to empowering and equipping its students to be socially responsible in Singapore and beyond. Last but not least, we have Mr. Joseph Sun from UPenn. Mr. Sun will explain the importance of establishing a sustainable infrastructure 
an operational environment at the institutional level so that uh, university in initiatives lead to meaningful and impactful contributions to society. Please welcome Mr. Sun. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased and honored uh, to be here today to speak on this panel along with these esteemed representatives from leading higher education institutions from all around the world. As the title of this plenary suggests, I will briefly share some thoughts on the topic of strategies and models for the development of social responsibility, university social responsibility. And as the title of my printed abstract states, my remarks will be framed around issues pertaining to the practice of service learning as one of the many strategies by which uh, universities may undertake the expression of university social responsibility. My comments are drawn mostly from our work at my university over the past 15 years, reflecting on what we have learned from our successes as well as our mistakes, and from the lessons learned from our partners over the years. As is the case with the university social responsibility and service learning itself, on a global level, the thoughts that I will share here are very much a work in progress. First, recognizing constituencies. Oh, and by the way, you'll notice I haven't prepared any visuals for you. So uh, you'll just have to sit and listen. <laughs> Contently listen, I hope. Recognizing constituencies. As higher education institutions, there is sometimes a tendency for us to focus primarily on our own mission of teaching our students through a pedagogy of learning, through community serving experiences. When this happens, we fail to realize that the service we are rendering may in the long run not be very effective, nor very good for the communities we are seeking to serve. Local communities must be valued as a partner and not just a recipient of our service. Our efforts must include methods by which we can work together with local communities as equal partners that are seeking to achieve mutual benefits. There are other additional entities in this regard that are also partners and fellow stakeholders in service learning. Here are just uh, five on my list for the purpose of today's conversation. Uh, the first, communities in need. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the communities themselves. The first constituency I want to mention is indeed the communities. Low resource communities worldwide are seeking assistance to improve the living conditions for themselves and their children. This includes a wide assortment of sectors that are critical to the well-being of people and their communities. Health, water, sanitation, education, ICT infrastructure, access, food security, and the list goes on, are among myriad needs that require ongoing attention and inputs of resources. A second group that I want to mention here is the non-governmental organizations, NGOs, that are seeking resources, typically re seeking resources of all kinds to undertake development projects that will benefit the communities in which they work and live and serve. There are also NGOs, um, namely private foundations, that are resource enablers, and for them, they are seeking partners with whom they can work to provide resources to meet community needs. A third constituency, and I want to call them as constituents, is in fact students as learners. Now we get closer to our own home territory by mentioning our students as a constituency. Today's students worldwide, we all recognize this, and it has been repeated throughout uh, today's sessions, that they want a practical hands-on experience as part of their education. Many have a strong desire to make a difference. This is the generation of today's students, right? Uh, and they want to change the world for the better. 
During the course of their studies, they seek such learning opportunities, even as they are formulating for themselves ways in which they can make some sort of contribution, however small or large it may be. The fourth constituency on my list is none other than we ourselves, higher education institutions. As universities, for the most part, we want to prepare students for lives that will render meaningful service and contribution to society as, we tackle, as, uh, as they, the students, tackle the most difficult challenges in our world today. And we do so by seeking to impart skills and knowledge that can be used to address these challenges, all the while seeking to broadly and liberally educate them about the world and all of its complexities. And the fifth uh, and final constituency I want to mention um, this, morning, this afternoon uh, is the world of for-profit corporations themselves. Motivated by corporate social responsibility, CSR, uh, like NGOs that I mentioned previously that are resource enablers, companies through CSR are seeking to serve as partners to help meet the needs of low resource communities worldwide. They are in the admirable position of providing much needed resources such as donations of products and uh, equipment and goods, perhaps cash, and certainly services through donations of valuable human capital, uh, their own um, professionals with many capabilities. Okay, so with all of these constituencies from all of the above, I think we can easily recognize the common shared interest in social responsibility through service. It may be obvious that when these constituencies are able to work well together, including us as universities, as higher education institutions, when we are able to work well together, much can be accomplished. However, it is less obvious to recognize or to understand that there are some differences where these differences may serve as key drivers and motivators for making decisions, and where conflicts, potential conflicts of interest may arise. In these instances, very well-intentioned efforts often become diminished, and precious resources are depleted, and the overall good that was intended in the first place is reduced or worse. A key for those of us in higher education institutions, I believe, will be to work in such a way as to be able to invest deeply in a process that helps us to recognize and understand the various constituencies and to make our decisions, our decisions about any service learning program in the light of our own findings. Our own experience over the years has included projects that failed to fully appreciate some of these dimensions. These issues not only inform the higher education institution itself as far as strategic decision making is concerned, it also provides our students a valuable learning experience, helping them to understand the complexities that are at play in community serving efforts. Some key principles. Next, I just want to mention a few things here. Through the last uh, 13 or so years of our experience working in this arena, implementing around 30 or so global service learning projects to date, we've come to frame our approach around some key principles. Due to the limited to time that we have, I will just simply provide a list of these principles that have helped guide us in our approach. Number one, involve the community as an equal partner. Understand its need, its limitations, and where there may be potential conflicts of interest. Before proceeding with a project, ensure as much as possible that there is local commitment. Number two, Partner with a credible NGO and or partner with a local higher education institution. Number three, place an emphasis on building local capacity that will enable the local community to sustain and continue the effort. Number four, 
go local where at all possible to source supplies and other resources that may be needed. And finally, number five, be prepared to make a multi-year commitment to a local community. Here I'd like to just uh, pause briefly to mention two practical items that are key elements of uh, our model uh, as we continue to um, seek to do this work. Am I making the screen jump around? Sorry about that. Uh, number one, a key part of our strategy is to make site assessment trips as part of our planning process. The value of this activity cannot be underestimated. Through the site assessment trip, and sometimes multiple trips are required, we're able to firm up the personal relationships on the ground with our local community partners. We're also able to assess the physical and material conditions, and we're able to understand and appreciate what might be some local political as well as organizational issues that could impede the success of a project. Number two, the second practical item. For all of our projects, students are selected to serve as student team leaders. They work side by side with faculty and staff to plan, design, and execute these programs. This has become a key part of our model. It enables the students selected as team leaders to develop exceptional leadership skills and knowledge. And we have program leaders who can relate to students on any team as a peer. We have found this to be an invaluable asset. Preparing for service learning engagement. And just some thoughts to share on that. Through our experience, we've come to develop an approach to designing a service learning curriculum that enables students to take a holistic view of their engagement. As an engineering school, most of our projects have involved the design and implementation of some sort of technology or some sort of engineering. And it is very easy, if not natural, for our students to spend an inordinate amount of time on technical aspects of any project. This is a no-brainer, as they say. However, we fully recognize that the technology is at most one half of the equation when it comes to a successful implementation of any project. Hence, we have incorporated key principles of appropriate technology, sustainable development, into what the student learns. We also include a substantive section on understanding something about the local history, customs, traditions, and language of the local community. Finally, students are introduced to our multi-stakeholder approach to, uh, to service learning. As it has been repeatedly said, um, and as Hong Kong Poly U has demonstrated amply, the leadership of any higher education institution must show commitment to engagement and to service. By doing so, not only can resources be aligned, but also a climate of engagement and service can be fostered. Some summary thoughts. In my remarks, I have tried to reflect upon our work over the past 13 or so years in service learning and sort them into some thoughts on how our experience can be gathered into more structured ways of thinking about and approaching the work of university social responsibility through service learning. So here I provide what might be some quote unquote organizing themes that may be helpful for us as higher education institutions in developing a strategy and forming a model for university social responsibility through service learning. Number one, a multi-stakeholder framework. It is important to work within a multi-stakeholder framework that appreciates the complexities of engaging with communities and other organizational stakeholders, seeking to understand both our commonalities as well as our differences. Number two, an economy of service learning. We must recognize that we are both suppliers and consumers in an economy of service learning, along with other stakeholders. 
and as such, work to maintain an appropriate balance that takes into account costs and benefits in multiple di dimensions. And finally, number three, an ecosystem of service learning. Finally, I want to suggest that service learning might be thought of as a working, uh, as a kind of working within a kind of an ecosystem. I'm thinking of the delicate balance that must be sought after as higher ed institutions, as we attempt to insert ourselves into the work of local service providing and in international development, seeking to meet the needs of resource poor communities through service learning, even as we seek to fulfill our own mission of educating our students. If it is not done in a responsible and deliberate manner, we risk potentially upsetting that delicate balance that may exist in any community. We risk failing to properly teach our students about responsible and sustainable engagement. And we ultimately risk eventual failure as higher ed institutions in our university social responsibility efforts through service learning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sun. Um, choosing our partners well, uh, understanding the real needs, developing sound strategies, and being prepared for long-term commitment will improve sustainability and impact of all efforts made in social responsibility. Um, now we'll have our Q&A session. Um, keep an eye on the time. So thank you, for, uh, thank you for submitting these questions. Let's start with the first one. Um, what, are the, what are the most significant challenges in universities' performance of mission of social responsibility? I think this is open to all. And anyone who's willing to kick off, please go ahead. Um, I think... Uh one challenge for us is around reward and recognition. Uh, I think we've tradition, and this came up in the previous session, we have a lot of colleagues who are, are very uh, pressed for the time and commitments they have already within their research and teaching work. And when you raise uh, social issues around social responsibility, one of the responses you might often get is, is this another additional thing I have to do on top of my other responsibilities? And uh, the key thing for us is to try and ensure that it's embedded in people's work, that it's just part and parcel of what they do, but also that there's a really strong sense that the uh, institution rewards and recognizes this work. Because if that's not in place, people might not uh, want to be so involved in it. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Just to <coughs> say that I completely agree. Um, I think um, um, there has to be a sort of a cultural change within the universities. Um, um, I'm not so sure about universities, but schools. I mean, if you think about uh, sort of primary and, and secondary schools, um, they uh, used to play a very important leadership role in the, in the, in the community. Um, so school principals were very important people I mean, because, because they were really the community leaders. Um, but I think over the years, especially for universities, uh, we've lost sight of that a little bit. Um, so um, the reward system, uh, the whole setup and all that uh, is now really uh, much more um, uh, focusing on sort of uh, uh, publication and patents and research grants, how much money you bring into the university and all that. Um, but. Um, um, I'm hopeful that you know, with uh, with 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 uh, what we call 21st century uh, education, with a sort of a balanced uh, uh, emphasis on hard and soft skills, um, uh, university social responsibility and service learning and and the whole gamut. I think is going to play a more important role in 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 the future. But uh, I haven't yet seen uh, that being built into the reward system. Um, at any university. It may be a minor thing, but uh, support staff or support facility would be very important to reduce the burden of the researchers in, in, involving 
this kind of activities. So more staff should be hired for that. Thank you. If I may just uh, amplify that, uh, I'm greatly challenged by this because I, I, I also agree that on the one hand, we need to find ways to make it really easy. But on the other side of the same coin, we have to recognize that it's really hard. <laughs> to do it responsibly, it isn't easy. And I know many, if not all of us agree. To do this responsibly and sustainably recognizing the partnership and the importance that the community uh, uh, that, that we place on the community itself. This is really hard. It's really hard. I, that's the really tricky part for me. Yeah, I think that is the, we should also the, put this the, uh, in the long term the planning for the university the top to the rising also should give some policy encourage the faculty, both faculties and students to uh, involve for, the, uh, f for them to, uh, first of all, in increasing the regulation of the, how to, uh, it should be taken responsibility uh, for the students and the faculty. Also, university should give some of the policies to encourage the students uh, and the faculties. For instance, we can give the, you say, for some the, the service learning gives them credits for the students. So it's easier, and also that is the uh, encourage the professors, not just the, you say take the uh, the social work as your department, but you should serve the communities and the uh, involved. That is in the not just the, you say uh, for the uh, for your college, but also the universities uh, and also the some the responsive uh, the some works for the. The, for the local government. For instance, the, the, the Hong Kong Poly and the Sichuan University, we have the seat, we have the seat, the base, for the students, especially for social works, and the students study the medical sciences in the disaster areas in the Mianyang and the Qionglai and the Qinping in Mianzhu County. So that is that every summer in the, in the vacation, the students get there to, uh, to work. So that is uh, very important, and also that we have the, the advisors to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have heard a lot about universities uh, develop programs and support their students to uh, get them more in, engaged in social responsibility. This following question is about how um, universities train teachers and uh, maybe administrators to promote social responsibility um, across university campuses. My, sim my simple answer to that is conscript them and put them into the field. <laughs> Most before, efficient way of training. Before that, make them go through the very same pre-service, pre-field experience uh, training program that we put our own students through. And I find that many of them um, readily make themselves available for that. They understand and appreciate the importance of properly preparing themselves for, um, for engagement into the field. But as to um, the question, perhaps is that part of the question, how do you motivate them? Mm -hmm. Or this is just about training, about never training, mind. But so once you get them, how do you train well. them, okay? And, uh, and also, I think that the university can you say, in, uh, try to set up some international platforms. And, uh, as I mentioned, that the Institute of Disaster and the Management and the Research, uh, like joint with the Hong Kong Poly and the Sichuan University, that is that we uh, uh, get some fundraising to support the, the faculties to not, uh, not just research and teaching, but also the advice the students to involve, that is, uh, to serve the community and the disaster areas. Um, I actually think that uh, 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 quite a lot of training is necessary. Um, just to draw an analogy, um, um, or perhaps I should say that, um, um, you know, this uh, kind of experiential learning, service learning, is a very different form of learning from classroom learning. Right? So we are all used to classroom learning. Um, actually, uh, many of us, uh, when we become professors and we have to teach, teach in the classroom, actually we've never gotten any training. That's why university professors are usually very bad teachers. <laughs> um, but, 
but let's try not to commit the same mistake uh, when we try to change the paradigm of teaching and learning. Um, it is a very different form of uh, teaching and learning, and it's something that uh, uh, people with a PhD, you know, who go through the traditional kind of uh, education program, are ill-equipped for. Um, so um, I think uh, we really need to, to, to think about, you know, the learning objectives and then to work backwards. How are, what are the best ways to achieve those learning objectives? What are the different, completely different types of uh, activities that you want to have with the students, completely different types of assignment and so on. I, I think that's uh, actually um, a brand new way of, uh, of teaching students that none of us, or many of us, have not gone through before. Yes. Uh, I myself is trained on this occasion, so this kind of uh, conference is very effective, I think. Thank you. Okay, we've, we've seen how uh, different universities have um, um, encouraged and motivated the students while they're on campus, while they're a student, to engage in social responsibility. But how do you encourage them to continue after they leave, uh, after they graduate? Just to, to say something very quickly, I mean, earlier I mentioned a, a, a student project which is called BHBH, uh, Big Hands, Bigger Hearts, uh, which has been uh, operating in the Philippines for 10 years. Um, I um, happen to know the uh, students who started the, the program quite well. Um, and I follow them through, you know, uh, from the time when they were undergraduates and they started this, then they graduated, they got into the job market and so on and so forth. Um, it's hard, it's extremely hard because, uh, you know, when you first get into, uh, you know, your, 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 your work and your career, um, you need a lot of time, right, to build up your, your career. Um, but I think it's useful to sow the seed in the students. Um, because what I find with the students who started the BHPH is that after a few years, when they feel that they are a bit more stable in their career, they, they tend to go back um, because they've developed a passion for it. Um, so um, I, I think it's a matter of, uh, of uh, expectation. Um, so students may not uh, continue to do this, this year after year, but, uh, but they can certainly influence others. And when they are ready to go back, um, they can bring with them a lot more expertise and experience from their career, and that is very useful. Um, from, from my point of view, we, we sort of try and see uh, a sort of life, life cycle of, of, of students. So we have uh, communities of people who will become students at the university, so we do a lot of work uh, with uh, young people from the age of 11 up to 18, just before they apply. So that's one group. Then we have students who are with us, and then we have our alumni. And there is a there should be a, a cycle where we are continually working with these themes throughout that life cycle. So the governors program for schools, for example, we we do a lot of work with uh, alumni of our university to open up that volunteering opportunity for our alumni. So we try and see it as a continuing process, so that the student doesn't disappear. Uh, when they when they sort of graduate, they will be continually part of that ethos of social responsibility, whatever area of professional life they might go into. I think it would also be really wonderful, and perhaps it's already being done, to engage alumni with current students to oh, continue yes. uh, on the same causes or same projects. Um, so now we move on to maybe a more difficult question: How do you measure? the benefits of your service learning initiatives and use them to promote um, further participation? Yes. Perhaps it's not so easy to measure uh, quantitatively, I mean, A plus or A or whatever, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, community itself will answer to that question because we, we send out uh, uh, graduate and then they will find uh, that such kind of program is useful. So, not evaluation, just as it is. 
Um, we're, we're going through a transition at the moment. I think when we started social responsibility work, or when we started labeling the work we do in this area, social responsibility in the university, we were very good at counting outputs. Uh, so we had, you know, a thousand visitors to the museum or a thousand young people came and did this course or a hundred governor. So we measured lots of outputs, but we were quite poor at measuring outcomes. And, uh, and that's the, the new work that we're doing now is being much more attentive to outcomes of the work. So if you put a University of Manchester member of staff in a school, uh, we don't just count that's a one person in a school, we actually start to look at what are the, what's the attainment changes of the young people, how's the school changing in terms of its ethos, its governance. So that is absolutely a vital part of this. Mr. Sen, were you gonna, was you gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I, um, I guess I was thinking of a couple of things, uh, getting back to the matter of constituents. Um, as uh, Professor Sheck has amply demonstrated, and through all of the work that Paula Yu has uh, been undertaking uh, over the past two years, and as they've published, and as many of us do ourselves, um, on the matter of uh, students as constituents, uh, I think we have some pretty good metrics there. Students who engage consequently tell us that these have been life-changing experiences as to how far this carries into their future lives and careers and professions is anyone's guess. Um, but I, so if, um, you know, I, I, that's one way to measure, I think, impact and success, right? Another way is, and it's a fairly simple one for me and the sorts of projects we do, uh, as we undertake projects uh, in water and sanitation and solar energy and ICT installations and so on and so forth. Five years from now, what's the status of the stuff we put in, we help the community to put in? After we, after we leave, do they report back, or as we, as we do our monitoring uh, vi visits, do we see that the thing has just gone to dis disuse and disrepair? Well, that would not be a, a benchmark of success for us. And that will have indicated to me that somehow we didn't perhaps do all that we could have or should have uh, in the planning and the execution of this. And that's a hard lesson to learn, and um, that's an even harder one to face with our own students when they're informed about sort of the lack of success of the installation, right? So. I have been told that we are out of time. So um, unfortunately, there are other questions that have been submitted, and I encourage you to please uh, reach out to the panelists um, after, maybe during coffee break. Um, I hope you are all as encouraged as I am to see how much different universities are investing in the development of systems, structures, programs to make social responsibility part of their everyday existence. Um, please join me in thanking, once again, all the panelists of this session.